hello everyone, this is Bill Griffin. Welcome to Different Take Podcast. If you like this content, please subscribe, like, share, comment. I really appreciate you watching. New episodes Tuesdays and Thursdays. Recently, uh, and I'm doing this as of uh, November 2nd, 2022, but over this past weekend, Paul Pelosi uh, was struck in the head with a hammer. Paul Pelosi is the husband of the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, second in line to become president after Kamala Harris. She has security with Capitol Police security. Uh, Capitol Police is responsible for her security when she's in the Capitol, but I understand they also are involved in security at her at her primary residence and whatever other residence she has, I suppose. It's a very wealthy couple, so it's kind of strange, and the details are sketchy. Police say they observed this person hitting, striking Mr. Pelosi in the head, and so that on its face, uh, you would think the person is very disturbed. But the media has been trying to tie this uh, to Republicans. In other words, their rhetoric had some sort of uh, cause, and they're the cause of the violence, and they should tone it down, and so forth and so on. So uh, that's what I kind of want to talk about, how the media is sort of deceiving people. And I've got a couple other examples of this. There was an interview this past Sunday, which would be uh, October 30th, on CBS Face the Nation, and the host, or the interviewer, her name is Margaret Brennan. I don't know why anybody watches this stuff after seeing this, but uh, she's interviewing Tom Emmer, a Republican congressman from Minnesota. They're going to be voting. I know, and I would love to talk about something other than people being worried for their lives, but unfortunately, that's where we are. I want to ask you about this when it comes to political violence. On your Twitter feed, you posted this video we're going to show just a few days ago where you're firing a gun and it says, enjoyed exercising my Second Amendment rights, hashtag fire Pelosi. Why is there a gun in a political ad at all? It wasn't an ad. Hashtag I was, I was tweeting tweet. out. I was tweeting out Hashtag something that I had just done. Hashtag fire Pelosi with a weapon. Well, now wouldn't you're, a pink slip be more fitting if it's about firing her? It's interesting, Margaret. Why a gun? It's interesting, Margaret, that we're talking about this this morning. When a couple of years back, when a Bernie Sanders supporter shot Steve Scalise, which was horrendous when a Bernie and Sanders horrific, supporter which is shot why we Steve should Scalise, be not I never heard you or weapons. anyone else in the media trying to blame Democrats for what happened. We need to stay we focused on what we're all coverage. doing. So Margaret Brennan likes to interrupt. She's not really interested in hearing uh, what. Mr. Emmer has to say, the, she's trying to say, well, hashtag fire Pelosi could mean um, if he were seeing her in a campfire that he was trying to set her on fire. I don't get the connection. Uh, this is really uh, senseless. But this is what the media does. And um, I think I'll describe what I think is happening a little later. But people that watch this and they don't really get other viewpoints, what they're doing is, and what this person is doing, Margaret Brennan, I mean, is she's trying to elicit an emotional response. She doesn't care about logic. She's trying to tell a story. And if she's going to shut you down if your words don't match her story. Here's another clip. That, no, okay, looking at your candidates, Republican candidates have spent more than $116 million on ads that mention Speaker Pelosi by name in this cycle. If this is about the issues, why don't you make it about the issues? Why not depersonalize it? it is. I don't think there's any way Margaret Brennan is going to ask Democrats to not personalize or scold them for personalizing their ads, their commercials. And if you watched... If you've been watching any media, internet, television, radio, or listening to radio, whatever, you're going to see personal attacks all day long by Democrats and Republicans alike. But she sits there with a fa- straight face and says, you should not personalize these ads because you're causing, uh, the implication is you're causing violence. She doesn't come out and say this, but that's what she's getting across. And if you read the YouTube comments, there are two, they're very supportive of the interview. So they're buying this idea that this person could and probably was influenced by 
some sort of Republican rhetoric, although there's no facts to support this. And even if this person had a political ideology, if they're a disturbed person, so what? It has no, that has no impact. So the shoe, if it's put on the other foot, uh, if Democrats said, oh, if Republicans said, oh, somebody, for example, Steve Scalise, who was shot, Republicans weren't blaming Bernie Sanders because this fellow who did it was a Bernie Sanders supporter. I understand that this person is probably um, a serious mental health problem. But the media has done this over and over again. The biggest example of this sort of hoax, in other words, people jump on the bandwagon because it fits their narrative. They don't care about the truth, is the Jesse Smollett story. Media really, really uh, pumped this story up that this was somehow tied to Donald Trump <laughs> because assailants were uh, MAGA supporters. And Robin Roberts did an interview with Jesse Smollett uh, on Good Morning America, and it was a very, it was a very friendly interview. She did not. Um, ask him any tough questions whatsoever. Although she claims later she's reluctant to do the interview and um, suspected him uh, of not telling the truth. This is a tweet from Kamala Harris. Uh, Jesse Smollett is one of the kindest, most gentle human beings I know. I'm praying for his quick recovery. This was an attempted modern day lynching. No one should have to fear for their life because of their sexuality or the color of their skin. We must confront this hate. So she takes it, him at his word that these assailants who he arranged to hurt himself were, in fact, uh, Donald Trump supporters. And Donald Trump was somehow the cause, and you have to stop this hate because Donald Trump is hateful. And this continues to this day with the media, with the January 6th committee hearings and so forth and so on. I picture some Democrats, not all, they probably get their read, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the Philadelphia Inquirer, LA Times, and they watch Good Morning America in the morning, and on the way to work, maybe they listen to NPR. They're certainly not ever going to listen to Rush Limbaugh because they're told he's evil. Although they've never listened to him, they think he's evil because they trust the people that have told him this for some reason. And then maybe when they get home, they might watch the network news or uh, MSNBC, uh, Joy Reid, or something like that. So these media outlets are, um, and all media, is to, media outlets do this to a certain extent, but these media outlets are not that concerned with telling you the truth. They're concerned with telling you a story. So you believe the story because you want to believe the story, not because it's actually been checked out or anything. Another example of this is, um, and this is really more to the media lying and uh it fits their uh, narrative. The Kyle Rittenhouse uh, case. So this is, uh, I'll start with a clip. This is uh, a gentleman named Peter Bogosian. You can find it on the Peter Bogosian uh, YouTube channel. It's entitled, All Things Reconsidered Coverage of Kyle Rittenhouse and Ira Max Kendi on the NPR YouTube. So they're critiquing an NPR interview that was done after the verdict. So uh, they do such a good job of this. I'm going to play uh, a couple of minutes of it. Rittenhouse, what about the people that want to valorize Kyle, Kyle's uh, supposed victims, the people that he had to defend himself against? Let's talk about those heroes. Okay, let's talk about it. These Rosenbaum, he was charged with 11 counts of child molestation, two of which he was convicted of during a plea bargain. And just to be clear what that means, that means he was raping five to 11 year old boys. He was anally raping boys. That's who went after and tried to grab the gun of Kyle. And yes, if you're car legally carrying a firearm in the street in the United States and somebody tries to grab your gun, you should shoot them, okay? Second one, Huber was a repeat, offender, a repeat offender of domestic abuse. Uh, one of the charges was choking and threatening to gut a younger boy. 
he was the one that tried to hit Kyle on the head with a skateboard, and everybody said, well, that doesn't warrant deadly force. Let me tell you something. Getting hit in the head with a skateboard does warrant deadly force. If you don't think so, let me hit you in the head with a skateboard. We'll find out. <laughs> and the third one was Rosencrantz. He was the one who on the stand admitted that before he was shot, he pointed his pistol at Kyle's head. He said that during the trial. And yes, if somebody points a pistol at your head, that is above all else the time that you should pull the trigger if you also have a gun. And he was convicted previously of um, being intoxicated and 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 carrying a firearm at the same time. And he's he was illegally carrying his pistol, unlike Kyle, who was legally carrying his rifle. And in that, just to be fair, I would mention Kyle's arrest record too, except he doesn't have one. But that's that's who they're valorizing. Keep that in mind when you when you see pictures of these guys put up like they're some heroes. These are men who rape young boys, and they weren't out there to protest social justice. They don't give a shit about social justice. In fact, one of them was using the N-word constantly, trying to antagonize some of the black protesters that, they, that were there. They were there to help burn down Kenosha. They wanted to enjoy the fun and burn and loot and riot. That's why they were there. That's who those people are. That's who NPR is defending a belief in some extreme corners that vigilantum is in fact okay and perhaps even a duty. Um, and we're also seeing a surge in anti-Semitic messaging. What does any of that have to do with anti-Semitic messaging? <laughs> Where did that come from? The only thing they haven't actually mentioned yet is Nazis, but I'm sure they'll put one in here in a second. Can you get into that a bit more? I mean, why would this case and the verdict be giving rise to anti-Semitism? Yeah, you know, it might seem surprising and a stretch, right? <laughs> yep. You know, this wasn't really a case where religion was uh, involved. Right. Um, interesting. Religion, uh, anti-Semitic, in interesting. This really ties back to a grievance that many on the right have had around media coverage of Kyle Rittenhouse. You know, Imagine that. Imagine having a grievance <laughs> about media coverage when you can see the difference between the way NPR covered the story, peaceful protesters out for social justice who are probably black, shot by a white militia member far right who crossed the state lines with an illegal gun to hunt them down, compared to the actual reality of what happened, violent criminals and child molesters who were out on the street trying to burn down a building who, who attacked a young man who was legally carrying his weapon and got shot and got got what they deserve, to be honest with you, in that particular situation. So yeah, when you have such a massive discrepancy between the actual reality of the facts on the ground and what the media wants to present, because what they really wanted this to be about was race. Yeah, they would have exactly. loved it if those victims exactly. were black. They would have loved it. They would have ate it up. But because they weren't, they had to imply they were and lie about it the entire time. So right. yeah, a whole bunch of people many of whom aren't conservative or on the right, but just like would like to have honest media have a bone to pick with the way our, our mainstream media covered this particular story. Absolutely. Right. He was demonized, uh, mischaracterized, um, maligned in news coverage, um, you know, in the lead up to and during the trial. Um, Interesting. For, interesting, really think about that for a second. Anybody who doesn't promote their narrative is far right. Absolutely. Yeah, you're... That clip sort of speaks for itself. NPR is trying to paint a narrative that this will cause huge problems inside other people because they're political, just like the implication is Kyle Rittenhouse is political, and uh, there's no evidence that he was uh, political at all at the time. No evidence that he's a white supremacist. There's so many things said about him, and uh, the media was really, really beating a drum for a conviction, and they couldn't get it because facts didn't support it. That case should have never been brought to trial, but the media was pushing that. If the media weren't behind that, the trial would have never happened. The facts didn't support it, and that's what these two gentlemen go over very briefly. The implication was that Kyle Rittenhouse was, uh, or the assailants were not white and that they were actual uh, peaceful protesters. That could be further from the truth. That place was filled with people causing all kinds of mayhem, burning cars, burning buildings, looting, so forth and so on. These three, as you heard, had terrible personal histories in terms of uh, violence. These are a couple of headlines from NPR a couple of days after the verdict in the Rittenhouse case. This is from NPR. Far-right extremist Harold Kyle Rittenhouse's acquittal. I know a lot of people 
that um, I don't consider myself I, an extremist, reasonable person. Extremists, you think they're not reasonable. I know a lot of people that would say the same things about themselves. They thought this was a just verdict. They want justice. If you follow the case at all, the facts did not support a conviction. In PR, they have to paint a different a different picture of this. Next headline: After Rittenhouse verdict, activists fear for their safety at future demonstrations. Yeah, if you're an activist and you're out and you know people are there to burn and loot, yeah, you should fear for your safety. So, uh, that's accurate, but that's not really what they're trying to say. They're trying to say here that uh, activists are in the right, and they should be able to uh, protest, uh, you know, say peacefully. Many in the media didn't care whether their protests were peaceful or not. To you. So in court, they're arguing this self-defense piece, even though Kyle Rittenhouse admits that he knew Jason Rosenbaum was unarmed when he pointed the gun at him. But in the court of public opinion, they're really arguing that white men, especially white men with a gun, are allowed and have the space to defend and protect a country and a social order that keeps them at the top and a country that they stole from indigenous folks and built with black people's labor. This is the same entitlement that makes you go and storm a capital or a school board meeting based on absolute lies because the truth doesn't actually matter when you think you're entitled to do whatever you want in the name of some fabricated patriotism. So the jig is sky high. No matter what Sean Hannity wants to tell us, no matter how many tears Kyle Rittenhouse wants to cry on the stand, we know better. We know better, and I feel zero sympathy uh, for this this uh, young man who killed these two people. And one thing I find really interesting, Brittany, um, Kyle Rittenhouse walked past law enforcement that night. They saw a 17-year-old with an AR-15 uh, and did not stop him. When he was uh, turned himself into the police station, he was not cuffed. So you see there the idea that while the Rittenhouse verdict frees people up to, uh, to act violently, if you're listening to stuff and don't really know that Rittenhouse was really innocent because they're blaming the prosecutor, the judge, the jury, it was a fair trial. And um, Rittenhouse should have never been charged with any crimes at all. It was clear case of self-defense. But in this last clip, she doesn't say who the assailants were. She doesn't talk about the assailants. She doesn't talk about the facts of the case. Uh, and this is because it doesn't fit the story. When there's violence, it can, it's political. So this is, is what they're doing today regarding the Paul Pelosi matter. It's very unlikely that this person who struck Paul Pelosi is a Republican uh, activist, and, or even votes Republican or anything like that. But that's not what the media, they want to hide that from you. So they won't tell you. So if you're one of those people that I referred to before, that you're into the mainstream, you're getting your information from the mainstream media or the institutional media, you're not going to know uh, the truth because they're not going to tell you that this person has nothing to do with that. And they're certainly not going to explain the logic of, well, even if they were still probably deranged, otherwise you don't hit someone in the skull in front of two police officers. So it's a shame that, that people watch this stuff. I don't watch it. I've uh, done other episodes regarding the media, and if you watch this stuff, you're just going to get lied to and uh, misled over and over and over again, and you're not going to know the difference. You're not going to be able to discern the truth from reality. So that's my episode today. I really appreciate you watching. If you like this content, please subscribe, like, share, comment, and thank you very much.